Hello everybody. I haven't really been talking about what's been going on with me lately, but about two weeks ago, I really fucked my back up working out. It's been getting worse. I'm only sleeping about four hours at a time because that's how long the Tylenol and Advil work. So, um, my life is all weird as fuck right now, but I'm actually getting more work done than normal, so I appreciate that. I'm also in the shower getting my back under hot water. And I'm reading the next section in War All the Time for the Bukowski Book Club. So this is what I'm reading right now. I have no idea what this poem is. I haven't even looked at it yet. And for some reason I'm having a hard time reading it. But if you saw the video, I don't know if I posted it yet. One of you lovely people sent me a Kindle paperweight with a case and a charging dock because you guys are fucking awesome. You're just amazing. I was setting it up today. I need to learn how to side load things into my Kindle. I used to know how to do it. I think I just have to plug it in to my computer and then drag the shit over. I think that's all I have to do. But a lot of the books that I was about to just go buy, I actually have um, ebook versions of on my computer. So, I'll just do that. What I noticed when I was on my Kindle looking in the Amazon shop, like they fancy themselves Bukowskian to the point where they either name their book Bukowski something or another, or they um, write under a pen name like something Bukowski, or they call their book Bukowski and Me, or something like that. And I understand why you do these things. Because there's, there's a couple things here. First off, I think Bukowski, more than any other fucking writer out there, he's so conversational that when people read his work, I feel like they think he's like either a friend or a grandpa or an uncle or just that cool fucking dude that is willing to speak wisdom to people that society has forgotten. So I feel like there's a lot of people out there who fucking worship Bukowski and become writers because of Bukowski and then like kind of latch on to that in hopes that people who like Bukowski will stumble upon their books because of how algorithms work. And I was actually shocked at how many books have like Bukowski something in the title or that the writer just happens to also be something Bukowski. Like I understand why you do it, but I would be really interested if any of you watching this are one of the writers who have done that thing. Cause I'm really curious to see what kind of response you've gotten. Because I know, like, especially if you deal with, like, the Bukowski.net forums and stuff like that, the big fucking Bukowski fans, I don't want to say are bullies, but they're fucking bullies. And if they think you're a fucking poser, they're going to fucking tell you, okay? So the people that you would want to reach who would like your work, if it is, in fact, Bukowski-like, would spit on you for doing that thing in the first place anyway. What I recommend is if you have a book and you have never met Bukowski and you did not know him personally, do not use his name to try to push your shit along. Whether it's your pen name or whether it's a character name in a book or whether it's just a nice book title, okay? Don't do it. It looks try hard. If you knew anything about Bukowski, you would know that he would fucking hate that. He would be flattered, but he would fucking hate that. So what I recommend you do 
is in the keywords or in the metadata of your book, add Bukowski or Charles Bukowski or something like that. If you're really trying to seek out readers of Bukowski and it's not going to work as good, but it'll work better. Like you will get a better response from motherfuckers. I was gonna save this for the actual Bukowski book club video, but maybe I'll do it here. Maybe I'll do it here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, like this is like kind of Bukowski book club freebie here, okay? Because this is going to illustrate my point, okay? Of course, I love Bukowski, whatever. I had been writing and creating shit for fucking probably 15 or 20 years before I even found Bukowski. So I feel like I lucked out and in not falling into this trap. But I'm going to read you a couple poems. They're pretty short. And I'm going to read you a couple poems out of this. And then I'm going to ask you about your poetry okay and then you have to do some fucking soul searching and you have to be self-aware okay and if you can't be self-aware then just stop this video now and continue to jerk off with your posy okay but if you think you can like better yourself and um, are open to criticism okay then pay attention right now. So we are in the, in between pages 100 and 200 in the, or 101 to 200 in the Bukowski book club read along. I know I took some time off of it, I'm sorry. Okay, but I'm gonna read a couple poems to you. So the first one is called The Condition. All up and down the avenues, the people are in pain. They sleep in pain, they awaken in pain. Even the buildings are in pain. The bridges, the flowers are in pain. And there is no release. Pain sits, pain floats, pain waits, pain is. Don't ask why there are drunks, drug addicts, suicides. The music is bad and the love and the script. This place now, as I type this, or you, as you read this, your place now. So the first thing I'm going to talk about here with this poem called The Condition on page 150 in War All the Time in the Echo Edition. Bukowski was known as the poet laureate of Skid Row, okay? He was known by people because of how he wrote. People gravitated towards him because they felt he was writing for them, okay? Yes, did Bukowski write a shit ton of poems just about himself? Of course he did, okay? But this poem here is a really good example of him writing a poem about a large mass of people that people could relate to, okay? At the end, he says, you know, just like me in my room typing this right now, or you at your place right now. He is connecting himself with you, okay? That is why he endures and why so many other poets from his generation through the decades, fucking are either a flash in the pan or no one even saw them. They're like a fizzle in a fucking, a fart in church, okay? Because most people, when they write poems, especially confessional shit, okay? They focus on themselves all the fucking time. They think their pain is unique. They think what they are going through is something that no one else could possibly have struggled with. And they also have the fucking horrific idea in their head that anyone gives a shit about what they've been through. No one's gonna give two fucks about what you've been through until you become something. 
Once you are something, then people give a shit. Before that, nobody fucking cares. So look through your poems. Look through your poetry. If the stuff you're writing is just me, 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 there is a good possibility that no one will ever give a fuck about it. Okay? Now, with that said, I'm not saying ditch those poems. I'm saying be better. Think of yourself, like in the Anarchy Crew. So in the Poetic Anarchy course, we talk about the difference between confessional poetry, journaling, and journalism. I feel like a lot of, especially people who consider themselves confessional or just straight up free verse poets, can't get out of journaling. I do it too. I do it all the time. For every one poem that I write that is like more steeped in journalism, I have like 10 that are more like journaling. Now, pro tip, the way to make your poetry fucking soar above everything else is it's almost as if poetry is journalism plus journaling. Okay, and then once you got that down, simplify the fuck out of it, all right? That is what amazing poetry is, at least the stuff that I find amazing. I'm gonna read another poem to you here in a second that's the next poem in this book that also illustrates something that I see people fucking up all the fucking time. So this poem is called Bravo, okay? And it goes like this. Summertime dogs crush on freeways as young bodies leap into the sea. Outside rented motels at Del Mar as the fourth, fourth race unfolds, a race for two-year-olds, non-winners. They take the short turn home as I stand with weary pot belly fighting the eternal pattern, light and darkness spitting from everywhere. The dogs will die here and in Normandy. The heart will be held high like a flag and potted through the middle like a cooked apple. If we can find a band let the music play. Play was the last word of that poem. My phone cut out. <laughs> okay, um, what I wanted to say about this poem is, again, this is a racetrack poem, okay? But it's more than a racetrack poem. So, already, he has, like, cornered the market on racetrack poems. So people who go to the track know what he's talking about. He knows what a shit show it is trying to fucking find a winner on fucking two-year-olds that have never won a race, okay? Like, it's like, oh, fuck, this thing, I'm gonna fucking do this right now? He knows that the people who know what that is are going to understand that. So there is a lesson here, and that would be if you have a hobby besides writing, okay, that not a lot of people are into. Let's say it's a niche, okay? If you can write a lot of poems about stuff like that, there will be people who gravitate towards you, okay? Because they will look at you as, oh, you know the struggle, you know, okay? So there's that. The second thing is, he's, again, using real-world places. He's talking about Del Mar. The other thing he does here, I kind of get on him sometimes for this, because sometimes it feels a bit overboard, his use of metaphor. So this poem starts off with heavy metaphor, and then goes into the racetrack. And so a lot of people are thinking that this poem is about the racetrack, but it's not about the racetrack. The poem is about aging and dying, having to live knowing your time is short 
and you're just trying to fucking survive. You're trying to fucking make it. You're hoping against hope for some sort of fucking thing to bring you out of this. And one of the great little metaphors he uses in here is he says Normandy instead of World War II or instead of war or instead of battles or instead of a fight, okay? It's probably was used quite a bit since fucking World War II. And in 1983, or whenever he wrote that poem, it probably was used a lot more, okay, than it is now. But now, like that is probably not in the typical vernacular of people. And so when you say something that's like, you are referring to the struggle and the war you have to fight every day, but you refer to it as Normandy, like that's like a metaphor on a deeper fucking level, you know? And what I see a lot of people doing is just saying the fight or the struggle or the battle and stuff like that. You're not being deep enough. You're not being creative enough with your metaphor, okay? So what I would say, for those of you watching this who are going to try to be self-aware and critique your own work, do you talk about others? And I don't mean doing the you do this, you do that. Don't do that. Like, I'm talking about the people, the royal we, okay? Like, I really, personally, I dislike second-person poems. It, it, they, they read very preachy. They don't read like, you're one of us, and you're going through this as well, okay? So start trying to come up with poems about the things you're going through that will actually fucking relate to a wide group of people and write that poem to them for them, okay? Nobody gives a shit about you personally, okay? We're trying to expand your base. We're trying to grow your audience. We're trying to get you to be somebody who people can relate with, okay? So that's first. Second, if you have a niche of any kind that is kind of, not that you're an authority on it necessarily, but something that you can write about over and over again, that it doesn't like, just like this poem, it wasn't about the racetrack as much as it was about the, the battle of age and just trying to make it, you know what I'm saying? Because everyone who goes to the track will feel that way. Because in case you guys don't know, most of the people who go to the track fucking lose. And most of the people who go to the track go to the track with the fucking hopes that maybe today is gonna be different, okay? It's this ridiculous optimism that losers like kind of exude. You see what I'm saying? And I'm sure there's probably different groups of people who that exact same thing works with. Like maybe you're into Magic the Gathering, okay? There could still only be one winner. So maybe all of those people who go to fucking Gen Con or whatever con to fucking throw cards. Maybe they can understand that same analogy. They can understand the struggle. They can understand, I'm probably not going to make it out of this, but you know, I fucking hope so. Like if you're into that, I'm not into that, so I'm just guessing, but I'm sure if you go to these events, you could probably think of like that one guy who's like fucking like 60 and he's super overweight, his guts hanging out of the bottom of his shirt. Um, he kind of smells, he, he's not shaved at all and just looking a bit scraggly, but he's there every year in the hopes that this year is gonna be the year that he fucking takes that prize. And every year he fucking fails, you know? Something like that. And then also, when we're talking about metaphors, try to get a little more granular with your metaphors. Don't do base level shit. Come up with something that's a little more, like super, like down to a point. 
you know, that if people don't know what the fuck that is, they're gonna have to look it up. And I know that's something I always say don't do, but here's the problem that a lot of you guys don't understand is that I, for, I mean, shit, for the last like three or four years, I have been getting tons of poetry submissions from you guys. I've been getting tons of chapbook submissions from you guys, okay? And a lot of those poems are just about you doing something that is not unique. Like, because, like, seriously, I could read, like, seven or eight different poems from different people, and they're all going to be about the same thing, but not in a way that feels inclusive enough to bring people in to feel like they're a part of what you're talking about, which again is the Bukowski charm. You see what I'm saying? So going back to my original point, if you have a book that you wrote and it's called like Bukowski in a sundress or Bukowski and me or um, hanging out with Hank or something like that, don't put that out. It looks bad, okay? Use the metadata, use the algorithm, don't use the title. You will, like, it'll be like Carrie. Everyone will laugh at you. You and your fucking dirty pillows. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to take a shower and make my back feel better. I gotta get the fuck out of here. I've been in here too long. Join the Anarchy Crew, keep buying my books, take care of your back, strengthen your core, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.